As you know, the League of Women Voters is devoted to protecting and extending the voting rights of all eligible Americans. But our interest, as Sue said, does not stop with the act of voting. We are also interested in and attentive to what happens when those candidates actually take office and begin serving all of us. We are, in essence, a watchdog for good government. And that explains our interest in this evening's topic of private wealth and public bodies. Philanthropy means love of humanity, which suggests that all giving is good, or at least is done with good intention. But the story becomes a bit more complicated when gifts are given to public bodies. When this country was created, when our cities and our school districts were created, we essentially made an agreement with each other that we would tax ourselves to provide the necessary funds to create and support the institutions that would serve us all. If we needed new roads, we would draw on tax dollars to provide them. If we needed public schools, we would tax ourselves to build the schools and hire the teachers. If we wanted public libraries and parks, Likewise, we would again tax ourselves for those facilities and services. But as we were building this great country, we were also successful at creating great wealth for some individuals. In 1889, Andrew Carnegie called on millionaires of that age to distribute their wealth for the public good. Is there anyone in this room who's not familiar with the story of Carnegie providing money for public libraries across the country? Since then, an untold number of wealthy have stepped up to follow in his example, and that includes the wealthy in this community. We are privileged to have had many people here who have had great wealth and have gone on to share it with others. In 1936, Edsel Ford, a gross pointer, created the Ford Foundation. More recently, Ralph C. Wilson, Jr. left an estate valued at more than a billion dollars with instructions to spend it all for good works in Detroit and Buffalo, and the list goes on. I want to emphasize that tonight we are not exploring philanthropy writ large. We are focusing only on what happens when private money is given to public bodies. And by public bodies, I mean cities, schools, colleges and universities, parks, libraries, even water districts if they were ever to receive private support. We're also not talking just about the super wealthy. Probably every person in this room has written a check at one time or another to support a local PTO, a gridiron club, a choir Brewster's program. I know I have, I've written plenty of those checks. And whether that money comes in one very large check or in the accumulation of a lot of smaller checks, the questions are much the same. How should local bodies receive and use those donations? Who makes the decisions for how those private dollars are spent for public good? So here to help us tonight explore these issues are three people who know this territory very well and with slightly different perspectives. I could spend an hour extolling the experiences and virtues of all of them, so I hope you'll excuse me and I hope they'll excuse me for the relatively brief capsules of their really amazing careers. I'm going to begin with Miriam Nolan. Miriam became the founding president of the Community Foundation for Southeast Michigan in 1985. The Community Foundation knits together assets from small donors to high net worth donors to create funds for civic projects. Since its inception, the Community Foundation has distributed about $1.2 billion through more than 80,000 grants to nonprofit organizations throughout southeastern Michigan. It is now one of the 20 largest community foundations in the United States. It would be hard to overstate Miriam's influence on southeastern Michigan. She has been at the forefront of so very many significant projects in the region over the past several decades. To my mind, the most significant was her pivotal role in the so-called Grand Bargain that preserved the city-owned artwork at the Detroit Institute of Arts and helped secure funding that was essential to putting the city of Detroit on firmer financial footing now almost 10 years ago. I should also mention that Miriam recently retired. <clears throat> On to Dave Egner. About five years ago, following what was already a stellar career in development, Dave Egner was tapped to become president and CEO of the newly formed Ralph C. Wilson Jr. Foundation. 
The assets of the Wilson Foundation come from the estate of Ralph C. Wilson, a gross pointer who founded and owned the Buffalo Bills football team. The Wilson Foundation began with about $1.2 billion in assets under management, money that must be dispersed by 2035 in Detroit and Buffalo. So Dave's job is essentially to work himself out of a job in the next 13 years. <laughs> and I'm told that's harder than it sounds. Dave came to his current position after serving for 19 years as president and CEO of the Hudson Weber Foundation, another foundation created to invest private money in civic projects. He also importantly is on the board of the Council of Michigan Foundations, which provides guidance for philanthropies throughout the state. I also want to note that Miriam is a past chair of that council. And finally, Chris Fenton. Chris Fenton retired a few years ago after serving nearly 40 years as the deputy superintendent for business and operations for the Gross Point Public Schools. During his tenure, Chris managed millions of dollars worth of capital projects for the Gross Point Schools. It was also during his tenure that the school district established the Gross Point Foundation for Public Education, a 501c3 that is dedicated to providing private funding to enhance academic and enrichment programs for the Gross Point Public Schools. And here's a fun fact. I think it's important to know that as he retired from that job, the auditorium at Gross Point North High School was renamed the Christian A. Fenton Performing Arts Center, not because Chris Fenton had donated millions for the naming rights, as a, but as a result of the very high regard for his contributions to the school district over many years. So with that, if you could welcome these folks, I'm going to take my seat and we'll get started. I feel like I'm juggling a lot of things here, so I apologize. You ready for this? Ready? Okay. So. I want to start with a really basic question, which is why you think people give? What motivates people, especially people with great wealth, to reach into their pockets and write checks, especially large checks for public bodies? Who wants to jump in and start with that? <laughs> Thank you for that lovely introdu introduction. It's a real privilege to be here. Um, I, I think from my perspective in the school system, and you mentioned the PTOs and the support groups in the schools, I think the, uh, part of it is a connectivity. They want to be connected with the schools and they want to be uh, a participant in helping uh, the schools uh, improve and uh, provide programs or facilities that uh, will enhance the education in Gross Point. So uh, there's, and they do that through the individual PTOs, uh, the booster clubs, the choir clubs, music, and now the public, uh, the foundation for education. I think it keeps people connected. There's a desire to help, and uh, this is an, an, an easy way, uh, maybe easier for some, but it's an easy way to do it. Mm -hmm. So I've said I really value what the league does, and so I'm glad to be here. Also, when Joan calls, it's hard to say no. Uh, my husband Jim and I, Jim Kelly and I, have lived in this community for 37 years, um, and, and it's another reason why I'm glad to be here. Uh, I think giving is a very personal thing, and everyone is motivated by something a little bit different. And people learn to give through their families, through their religious congregations, but basically, people want to do good in general. If you look back, and I'll come back to a couple of your comments later, Joan, this country was built on people giving, giving time, money. Uh, and if we didn't have this strong commitment of givers, we wouldn't have the quality of life we have today. So why, why do people give? I, I do remember a donor of the Community Foundation I received one dollar every quarter in an envelope with a little note. And I never met the woman. But her motivation was that as a child, she shoplifted from a Kresge store. And she wanted to give back, and for her, a dollar was what she could do. 
why does McKinley uh, Scott, McKinsey Scott, giving $13 billion? Well, she has it in first place, but <laughs> <laughs> she wants to do good. Now, do people try to buy influence? Some do, but they're still giving away money. And I always try to say to people, while you're trying to do good, just make sure you don't do any harm. Well, there's not much I can add to that. Um, I, I can share quotes from the three foundations I work for. So I was at the W.K. Kellogg Foundation to start my career in philanthropy. And W.K. Kellogg said, I don't want to spoil my children with wealth. I want to be a good steward of that which divine providence has provided. So there was a spiritual connection as well as a realization that that wealth could uh, perhaps ruin the lives of his children in, in too large of, of, a, of a concentration. So he wanted to make a difference in that way. Um, the, the Hudson Weber Foundation, uh, J.L. Hudson talking to the Weber brothers in particular talked about being liberal in your approach and conservative, uh, liberal in your thinking and conservative in your approach to improve the lives of people in Southeast Michigan and Detroit specifically. They wanted to see something uh, improve. They wanted to see growth in the community that had embraced them and where they had built their wealth. And finally, Ralph Wilson. Uh, Ralph gave no uh, predetermined decision on where his wealth would be spent. He appointed four life trustees to do that and said to them, improve lives, but do it in 20 years. And part of that was because Ralph wanted somebody who knew him to make sure that those investments went to places he would have put them. So. Those, those are three direct answers, Joan. I think, as Miriam said, it's very personal. Yeah, very interesting. Um, I'm not somebody who has a lot of money. I mean, I donate as I can to local causes, but I'm gonna imagine for a minute that I have, say I have a spare, I don't know, $15 million <laughs> that I'd like to donate. Uh, I've decided, I've, you know, I've, I've had some calling and I feel like I wanna give back to the community. Really, where do I start to do that? Do I start by, you know, do I make a few phone calls to my friends? Do I uh, hire an advisor? Do I go to a foundation? What's the process? You know, walk us through the process for those of us who aren't familiar with, especially the high wealth individuals that are uh, interested in getting involved in this game. Let's start with Mar Mar Miriam did this for a few years, yeah. So I wish I knew you when I was at the Community Foundation. <laughs> You know, I think you start by, by in your own mind, you know you want to share and you want to make a difference and you care enough that you don't want to make a mistake. So where do you turn? You turn to your friends, you turn to a, an organization, a charitable organization uh, that you've been a part of or the, what, do you, what do you care about? So I think you first try to figure out, geez, I have this money, what is it I, probably know a little bit about doing, but I don't know how to get it done. So you can turn to, you, know, you can go online. In fact, I did that today. I think it was pretty interesting. There's now a lot of advice online. Don't take it all. Uh, it's or, all true, though. <laughs> until you push on it, right. You, you call your local community foundation and you ask them, no, I, that's enough. I don't work there anymore. Um, I think the serious thing you could do is uh, talk to financial advisors, talk to a lawyer who knows the charitable giving business, but and more importantly, try to figure out what you care about, then how you get it done. There are just tons of professionals out there that can help you, but, but you should be able to tell them, here's why I wanna do it and here's what I care about they'll help you figure out the best way to do it. And if you've got $50 million, there'll be lots of people that want to help you do it. Dave, you've been in this business, come on. Again, little like, and so many opportunities to, so, so many pathways to moving the money. So uh, is there a cause or a passion that you wish to impact immediately? Is there, it could be a park or a trail that you can make a capital gift and complete something immediately. Um, it could be that you want to see something over time, and you can use a donor advice fund, a community foundation, to do that work. So it, it, it really depends on what the end goal is, Joan. Um, and 
I start with your heart and go to your friends next and see what comes out of it. Okay. Yeah, the from the school's perspective, and if you were a, a donor with 15 million, I'm going to make a guess. And it's an assumption that the school, a public school system, was is probably not on the top of your list. So what we had to do in the school system is make the need known to people like you because there's a lot of a lot of great organizations out there that need money and uh, and to say the gross point schools a wealthy gross point district uh, needs money the that's a can be a hard sell so we had to make the that case for our need uh, I'll share one little thing back in 1975 I think it was a woman, uh, she, lived, she did, did live in Gross Point, lived in Florida, and I think uh, she was a, so, her last name was uh, Long, I think. And she died, and she had a trust, and I think she had maybe six, seven hundred thousand. Out of the blue, we get notice that she wants to donate 150,000, this is before my time, to Gross Point Schools to put the planetarium in at Gross Point North. It, it came unsolicited. So we were pleased, and, we, and that was an unusual thing from 75 up until, 19, uh, up until 1995. We didn't get many unsolicited gifts like that. I'm, I'm excluding the PTOs raising money for playgrounds, et cetera. So a large gift like then, I don't know what that's worth today, but it was, that's a significant gift. So from our perspective, being in a quote unquote rich district, we had to make our case known to people or otherwise we wouldn't have risen to their list even after they've consulted with a bunch of people, looked online, whatever, so. So that that's, raises a question about um, the challenges that individuals and foundations face when they want to donate to a public body. Is it different to donate to uh, a city, to a school district, to a university, than it is to transfer those funds to, say, a more traditional 501c3 like, you know, the Girl Scouts of America um, or something like that. And what are the, what kind of challenges do you face when you, you essentially you get involved in that public game? And I'll let Dave and Miriam start with that. Well, I'll, I'll start only because I'll set up Miriam, um, <coughs> who's who is we're friends. We're friend. friends. Um, and, and what, what Miriam was able to set up in the grand bargain is, the, is probably the, the greatest illustration, perhaps nationally, in, in that issue. So things to consider if you want to do something in the, for a public body. Uh, how long will the project take? Because the elected officials will likely change out. What are the potential liabilities that exist in the public sector versus the private sector, and how do they transfer one to the other? Um, how can you assure that the funds that you're putting in place get to their intended uh, destination? Especially if these funds could be overseen if given to a, to a public body by a commission, a council, a mayor, etc. cetera. Um, all of those issues have to be wrestled with. So using a charity or, an, or a, a, a school foundation or a 501c3 set up with a purpose gives enough of an arm's length to overcome a lot of those issues. With the grand bargain and setting that up, Miriam, I think we were meeting weekly by phone to wrestle with those issues for probably a good six months. Yes, yeah, so I'm not a lawyer, there are probably a number of lawyers in the room, but you can give a charitable gift to a public entity, a school, any of the cities, uh, a fire department, whatever. So just know that people sometimes say, oh, you can't do that. Well, you can do that, but you do it for a charitable purpose. You're not there to influence an action or to buy something to happen. And so be careful when you do it, as Dave said, is it something that can happen and you know you're funding that and that you can get perhaps a letter or a report back saying they did spend the money for that purpose and it's not unreasonable to ask for that kind of information back. So having said that, 
people do get nervous about giving to public bodies, and so you do have 501c3s set up, the various foundations for you know, each municipality here or the school or have you, what have you, which does make it clearer and easier. If you're gonna make a very, very large contribution to a public entity, I would just caution you to be careful because you are subject to audit as an individual or foundation when you give to any sort of organization. So just know, hopefully know what you're doing what we did with the grand bargain, and it is probably so unusual that um, let's hope it never happens again. The, the paid head, the CEO or president, and their board chair, I don't know, there's a reporter in the room, but he's not really reporting tonight, I know. Uh, we met every Sunday afternoon by phone of about 10 or 11 foundations because we knew this had never been done, and there were lots of considerations. So in general, large contributions that directly relate to a public body should be done carefully. That raises a question for me about um, the anonymity of donations. I mean, one of the things you said right off the bat, Miriam, was um, that there'll be a record of it. So is there, when you are donating to a public body, the expectation, the requ legal requirement perhaps, is that all of those donations be identified in some fashion? There's no such thing as an anonymous donation to a public agency? And I'm not, I, I am not Chris, aware. Joan, maybe Chris I, knows that. I don't think that's necessarily true. I'm not a lawyer, but I think you can make an anonymous gift to a, to a public body. Yeah, we, we've had anonymous gifts, small amounts uh, in the past, but in general, that was never an issue because people in general want their names. They want people to know what they've yes, done. Yeah, in general. Okay. Uh, from the gross, the school's perspective, go, tying back to what they were saying earlier, uh, when Proposal A passed in 1995, uh, we had PTOs, and when you wrote a, a, a check to your local PTO for a new playground, it was not tax deductible. A lot of people assumed it was, and they took the tax deduction, even though they couldn't, because with the exception of maybe two out of 20 organizations, PTOs, support groups, uh, none of them were 501c3s, with a couple exceptions. So we then encouraged, because the the funding mechanism for the school change, we encouraged all of them to form, file the papers, and we helped them with that uh, to become a 501c3. So, especially when you get up in the high school and you have athletics and uh, choir boosters and bands, they're going on trips and all this, it was to their advantage to make, these, uh, make this option available, and people embraced it then because they could get a tax deduction, and, and the, the, that connectivity that I talked about really started to hit. Um, uh, in, and at the high schools, you know, you, <clears throat> excuse me, they're, you're talking sizable, well, relatively to our, to our budget. You know, an organization raising $100,000 for various new equipment, uh, et cetera. So uh, it was really encouraging and people embraced it. We did have a bit of a challenge that, uh, unlike being a, with a, an organization since 1985, the PTOs rolled over. You know, you get a treasurer who comes and goes. So we had to help them because it's easy then not to file the papers with the IRS on time, et cetera. So we we went through a process in the school system of helping them do that, and uh, it became and it worked very well uh, to for the local uh, organizations to take those contributions and 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 talking about whether they get the project got done, it's a, that's really local. I mean, it's really local when you're putting up a new playground and you've made a contribution. You want to, it, it happens right before your eyes. So we didn't have an issue with that. Um, later, as these organizations grew, and the, the Mother's Club is another good example. I think that was already a 501c3, but they have a preservation arm over there, and they were raising money to make improvements to uh, Gross Point South uh, to keep the historical 
significance of those buildings, uh, keep them uh, maintained well. So there were a number of projects that were started and uh, we had to keep track of that in association with the district and make it sure what projects they were wanting to do and it, did we have money to help in, in that effort. So um, the Gross Point South uh, Auditorium was a great one. Uh, that project I think was about don't quote me on this, $1.5 million. And they raised money uh, for various aspects of the chandeliers, the, uh, the seats. And you know, if you go over there now, you're, there's names associated with the seats. And uh, that was a, a big project. We contributed money from the, from the school system. But again, uh, there was no, I don't think there was ever a concern expressed that yes, they contributed where'd the money go because they could see it happening. So this raises a question to me about the, the policies that exist for public bodies that are receiving money, uh, the donor policies. And I know, I mean, Chris has the most direct experience with this, and um, I guess I, w I would like to know what, what makes up a good, a model policy for, in terms of being the recipient of the money. What, what are the elements that should be in there to preserve, to be, to protect the receiver of the money, and what elements should be in there to protect the donor of the money? I'll answer real quick. I'm sorry, about, but because it all just kind of goes together. Uh, prior to the Gross Point School uh, Public Education Foundation being formed, the uh, we needed to uh, uh, have a mechanism in place to uh, a policy, and our policy way back when was really not very good. And I, I think the policy is number 805. If you ever have a desire to go online and you can't sleep at night, uh, look under the Gross Point website and it's, there's a policy on giving. And it, it, it took trial and error because some of the groups wanted to, not very many, wanted to say, okay, we'll give you this amount of money, but there's but you have to do this. Uh, we want to employ a certain person. And early on, the board said, whoa, we're not getting involved because now you're going to have outside. Now, I know colleges do this. They have a chair, uh, what do you call it, endowed chair. We didn't have endowed staff. And especially when you get into the specialty areas, uh, athletics, uh, choirs, band, I mean, you can say, okay, we'll take the $50,000, but I want you to uh, pay so-and-so to do that job. So early on, the policy said no. Uh, staffing it comes under the jurisdiction of the school system. It comes under our control. You can pay for all sorts of other things, but staffing is, is ours. That's forbidden. And we went through a, uh, three or four revisions of that, but I think it's a pretty sound policy that they have now. Well, if you give to a charity, uh, the charity is required to acknowledge every contribution of more than $250. And you are required as a donor to have that receipt. So there, there are issues with small, not in all cases, but unstaffed public charities where people roll over over time. So that when, it is partially your responsibility as a donor to be funding someone, some organization that has those kinds of policies in place. And if you, if you are worried about certain things, that's when you need to re reach out to someone and ask, if I do this, is it a problem to me as a donor? And, and again, the, the protection of a, of a 501c3 or another nonprofit between the public body provides some oversight because that charity has responsibility, liability, et cetera. Uh, so they would protect the donor in many respects in, in that role. Um, there are a series of, of, uh, of good practices that can be found in a number of places for nonprofits in receiving funds and treating donors. Uh, I've forgotten what the, the board group was that board source uh, is one of those. It's an, you can find it online, but it gives good practice and policy for how to acknowledge gifts, et cetera. Uh, I don't, I believe the public sector is more of a contractual arrangement. So um, if our foundation were making a gift to the city of Gross Point, we would have a grant agreement with all of the conditions spelled out. 
to make sure that there's an understanding between both those bodies and what would happen. Uh, and most charities that work with, with municipalities or with, with public organizations do the same thing. So there's, there is a good legal eye uh, that's in place to assure that, that it is uh, attended to correctly and to the donor's wishes. So, so wait a minute, our purpose here is to encourage you to give tonight, <laughs> not, not to say you shouldn't give. Those of you with $15 million, right. yeah. <laughs> so we've had quite a bit of um, newspaper coverage about the donor situation, especially in Gross Point Park um, in particular recently. The city council there recently rescinded its gift policy, and they argued that it was, the policy was impractical and actually insulting to donors. And there was one letter writer in the Gross Point News last year who suggested that donor policies could make large gifts disappear. So I'm curious to know from you, uh, in your experience, do donor policies discourage wealthy individuals from donating? Do they actually have any impact at all on the decision to donate? Let's take colleges and universities. They have pretty clear policies that are gonna be something that help you make a good gift. Um, I'm not as familiar with municipalities and their donor policies, but I would imagine that the goal there is to be clear about what they will take and why and how that relates to the public good. Well, things really changed when we formed the Foundation for Public Education at Gross Point. Uh, we started from scratch, and, uh, other than we had the PTOs and the support groups. So we really, uh, it's, I think it's worked out very well because we, we've gotten large uh, donations, small donations uh, in millions of dollars, and the foundation has worked very closely with administration to uh, take those funds and appropriate them to the appropriate areas. And, um, and it, it, st it literally started from scratch. And we, um, and I, the, the Gross Point swimming pool uh, at Gross Point High School in Fisher was a good example of a project that it started from, uh, we needed about, I think, I might be off here, but $700,000 to really finish that project up. And we um, got a nice donation from John and Marlene Bull Foundation. We had a huge, uh, contribution from the the booster club at, at South um, but it, it all it all worked uh, in accordance with the overall plan and uh, w again we had to uh, we weren't used to big gifts like that uh, we're used to the you know 10,000 and below but all of a sudden we got this big gift and then it developed where uh, some of the donor, and it all flowed through the uh, foundation. We never received money to the Gross Point schools. It went to the Gross Point uh, Foundation for Public Education. And uh, it, it's, it's been a great cooperation between the two. And uh, I, th I think you need a gift policy to cover, uh, cover everybody, especially from a public entity. We operate in a uh, different, scenario we, we have to comply with freedom of information act and all those requests so we have to make sure all the i's are dotted and t's and i think they've done a pretty good job and um it resulted in as this developed that we we got uh, some money and then from some people and, and they said okay we'll contribute i'm going to make numbers up now i'm going to contribute two hundred thousand, but if you match that it will throw more money and so it, it encouraged it but i think it was all within their policy as a foundation and then within our policies uh, from the school system. But I think we need a policy to, to oversee all of that. Especially then if, what I alluded to before, if someone says, okay, I want to give a gift to the foundation, but I want it to go to a staff person, uh, we have to have something concrete that says, no, you can't do that. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are some uh, limitations uh, for good or bad. I mean, uh, we're not a college, we're a public, uh, about K-12 institutions, so I think the policies are needed uh, from our standpoint, or on SAR, the school standpoint, to make it work properly. So it's really the power to say no, 
is, I mean, that's part of the va right. advantage of the policy, is the ability to say no when which, it's... Which we haven't done very often. Uh, <laughs> we, you can give money anytime. Um, yeah, I, as I recall, uh, in full disclosure, I was on the, the Gross Point School Board for two terms and, and w worked closely with Chris during the, that period of time. And I, as I recall, you, had a, you went through a process every year where you created a master list, a rather detailed master list of all the capital projects in the district and prioritized them. So there was never, uh, there was never any confusion about where, who was going to get the first dollar uh, during any given year. Right. That's correct, but it did, there was some co uh, controversy in there, a little bit, not much, because uh, we all get along. Yeah, we do. Um, I'll give you an example. We had, we, had a, we had the master list of all the things, and all of a sudden, um, uh, the renovation of the greenhouse at Trombley and uh, uh, Defer uh, was, was down at the bottom. Then all of a sudden, someone comes along and says, hey, we're going to do a fundraiser for it, and can we split that with you? Well, then all of a sudden, we've got to make the decision. That kind of boosts that up on the list. Because I'm not going to look a gift horse or horses in the, uh, how's that go? <laughs> there we go. So I want them to contribute. So there were some people saying, well, that's not fair. That project, which, which was down the list, all of a sudden pops up. And I said, yeah, it did because we got some money. Uh, some didn't like that. And I know, understand that. But uh, that's, that's the... I don't say it's a risk. That's just a, an issue that's going to happen once in a while. Didn't happen very often. So. Did you want to add anything? No. Okay. No, nothing that I can add to, to beat Chris and the gift horse. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just glad it was the mouth. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. yeah exactly. Well, all the uh, the gifts, especially the question about uh, big dollar gifts. All gifts raise questions, but the big dollar gifts especially raise questions about how they interfere. Uh, influence public policy and so I guess my question is how do you how do you ensure that the proposed pro projects fit the needs of the community and they're not just vanity projects that are being promoted to well support somebody's ego and that's a that's a question both for the foundations that are providing funds as well as for the recipient groups so look uh Let's let's do a, a, an example that'll get a little close to where Dave is. But there are lots of times that that I would see individuals make very large gifts, and I thought, "Geez, that probably isn't something I thought was exactly the right thing." But it was going to benefit um, whatever. Uh, so it is sort of in the eye of the uh, the beholder or the judger <laughs> of it. Um, it gets a little bit interesting when you decide that you're going to invest in public parks. Uh, I remember one of the first things that, that I did was we helped renovate Detroit parks for an individual. And I learned a lot about that. But when you're putting in place an asset that's going to benefit the public, not everybody's going to agree that's the best use of these charitable dollars. But think about all the great things that we have in Gross Point. Think about the parks that are being developed, the greenways that are being developed, the Wilson Park we're going to see on the riverfront. You got you to figure out, using a lens of, from, from the public standpoint, is this a worthy use of money? Even if, if it might, might not be where I put my million dollars. And is it done in a way that the public has had some say, let's say, now this is my private opinion, in, in what is happening. In, the, in the, the parks and the riverfront that's developed in Detroit, there's been huge engagement of the public in not only should it be done, but how it can be done to serve the public good. So I think there are lessons out there on how you can engage those that are going to be impacted by whatever the asset is. And that is, that's how you, you balance the private sector, the public sector, the government sector. It's really dependent on all of us 
to have a voice in what happens in the use of monies for the public good. It's a bit obscure, but I thought I'd throw it out. There. So part of what I hear you suggesting is that it's the, um, not so much the, maybe not the integrity, but the spine of the, the, the local officials and the staff of the municipalities or the school districts or whatever to, uh, to push back to respond to the, to the donor. Well, if, if you're going to receive a gift, you have the right to say yes or no or whatever. But it's also the responsibility of all of us. It's the, public, the public sector serves our, our good as well. So I'm not saying you just, if you, if you don't care about something, you can speak about it. It's for, for society to work, you've got to have all three legs of that stool working. The, the private sector and, and, and the private action for public good or for self-interest in public good in some cases. Um, the public sector doing its due diligence as well as being uh, having ethics and integrity along the way and the nonprofit sector filling the gap in between. So uh, from the donor's perspective, um, if it's a large gift, and I'll, I'll come directly to Ralph C. Wilson Jr. Park on the West Riverfront. We spent $750,000 to engage community and designers in what that park should look like. Uh, that was a $50 million investment for us. By the way, 20% of that went to maintenance and is in an endowment because we were thinking ahead about maintaining the park. But when you really look at the stacked public resources into the park and other private resources, it's a $90 million park. So $750,000 was a great investment to make sure it was owned by the community that would use it. In other cases, there are existing nonprofits that really are in charge of soliciting community uh, input and understanding and connecting it to the, to the public sector. Chris run, ran one. The role of, of, that he had was not only working directly for the schools, but also hearing what community wanted to have done. So that's why I really think these, these nonprofits that sit in the middle are, are somewhat the secret sauce to assuring as a donor you're getting the right input and you're not investing in something that won't be accepted by the public. I should have said this earlier, and I'm retired. I, I don't represent the school board now, the past school boards, when you were on, or the future ones. So I'm just, I'm just talking, you know? <laughs> so, but what, he was, what Dave was saying, there was an interesting thing happening in Gross Point, and this went on for years. Um, if you remember, how many of you went to Gross Point schools here? Okay. I thought there'd be more. Um, back when the buildings were built, uh, they were built without air conditioning. All schools today, I don't care if it's up in uh, Upper Peninsula, they, got, they have air conditioning as an example. All the buildings didn't have it. So one of the challenges was these uh, PTO boosters all started coming forward. Hey, we want air conditioning. Well, we can't afford it. It's, uh, it's too much money. And then we, we, we started replacing boilers and electrical systems, and we said, okay, well, for a little more, we can put some air conditioning units in. And, there was an ex and I remember, um, this just shows you how old I am, when Gross Point North was built, uh, my dad, who was a building engineer for the city of Detroit, he thought it was absolutely ridiculous that Gross Point North was air conditioned. Just ridiculous. We all went to school, you know, in our bare feet and uh, in snow up to our eyeballs. And for them to put in an air conditioning, it was just ridiculous. Well, it turns out you, the, the air conditioning is a part of the building now. But we went through a challenge that uh, some of these P, uh, PTOs raised uh, $7,500,000 to, to help put the air conditioning in. Others couldn't even approach that. So then you can become, so then you have a potential problem of the haves and the haves nots, have nots. Uh, and I'll, for, uh, Popart for, uh, it's closed now, but when it was running, they didn't have that kind of uh, support group to raise money. So then it became, a, but, but the key factor was you had to get people down at the table. You had the PTOs involved and the uh, principals, teachers, parents, and talk this thing through. And I, I think eventually it worked out that uh, everybody came, everybody wasn't 100% happy, 
but they were pleased that we were able to systematically approach it and do it. And like uh, Barnes School, which was closed as a K K six or whatever, uh, we had to put in there for the special needs kids. But so the, it, it it wasn't without controversy. And again, it wasn't big, and people were upset. Well, how come you're spending that much money over there, but you're spending less over here? We raise this much. Why can't they raise that much? And that was the same at the middle school. And uh, and it was a challenge at the high school when, uh, with the exception of the uh, the library and one other section, it was not air conditioned. Mm -hmm. And you know somehow we survived, but we ended up uh, putting air conditioning. And then. <laughs> and what it also did over there was started rumors. Uh, we all love rumors. And that was before the internet, uh, before Al Gore invented it. That was a joke, come on. Uh, uh, the, they, they were under the assumption that we put all the infrastructure in and we just didn't plug it in. The air conditioning was there, we just didn't plug it in. I'm not making that up either. And I would get nasty notes from people, teachers, um, saying, why don't you plug in the air conditioning? Well, we didn't have it. We had the, the, the guts to the thing, but we had to spend a lot more money. So it, it, it had some bumps along the way, but again, the key factor was getting everybody talking and involved. So. I'm glad you raised the issue of equity, because I think that equity is one of the questions that comes up most often when we're, you're looking at, especially big money gifts, I think. Well, no, that's not true. I mean, PTO is, is small money gifts in lots of ways, and there's big equity issues there. But I wonder, um, from the perspective of the Community Foundation and the, and the Wilson Foundation, do you, how does equity enter, enter into your decision making or how you try to influence the, the donors that you're working with? I'm going to turn to Dave in a minute, but I think equity is at sort of the heart of where many foundations are today, maybe more so now than before. But in terms of where you, if you track where the, the charitable dollars are going out of foundations, it does follow the donor's interest and the donor's intent. And so that, that will make certain things happen that may seem, well, why are you doing that versus something else? Um, but if, if you look at, um, where a lot of the money goes, it goes into the, the very basic human services that those needs aren't being met out of the public sector. Uh, and a lot of it is going into the, the areas that, even in the schools today, that deal with equity. Um, but I'm gonna, I'm gonna turn to Dave, who's gonna have a better, from the foundation standpoint, a better idea of the data, if we can give you any data about this. But equity, if you mean, the recipients and how that is being faced today by foundations. Remember, there's donor intent behind all of this. I don't think I have a better answer, Miriam. Um, the, we, we do have to reckon with the fact that w when we talk about philanthropy, we tend to talk about a very small percentage of what actually goes out charitably. The vast majority of giving is from individuals to the human service agencies, the churches, the health systems primarily. So equity is at the core of that. Philanthropy has been wrestling with this more and more as time's gone on. What, what do we mean by equity? Who's really left behind? What are the racial implications, the gender implications, the, the social economic uh, uh, implications? How is rural equity different than urban equity? These are huge issues. Uh, from the standpoint of, of most of the foundations working in the space of, of equity, uh, their approach is one of two ways. It's either an initiative that's focused on trying to bring light to the subject, or it's trying to thread through all of their programming how to best move the money in the most equitable way possible to make sure that those most underserved uh, have access. Uh, at the Wilson Foundation, as a limited life foundation, trying to affect the long-term impact of equity is really not in the cards for us. You, you can't do that in two decades. Uh, so for us, it's how do we thread it through? What's every program we look at, the questions are, are we getting to those least served? How do we get them at the table? How do we help our partner nonprofits serve differently, open it up differently? Access and equity are, are questions in everything we're doing. When we did our pre-interview for this, I learned, um, and one of the reasons I do this is so I learn something before I come out here and ask questions. 
And uh, Dave, you were talking about the difference between transactional uh, giving and transformational giving. I wonder if you could talk more about that and the, the, how that plays out in the, the work that you I, I don't know what you're talking about, Joan. I never said that. <laughs> um, we, we tend to think about giving as transactional. Uh, even found private foundations that have been in business for years still think of transactions. My only tool is this check I can write to you. And the reality is problems take generations to attack. Uh, issues take generations to attack. Uh, and so if you want to think long term and strategically, it's far less transactional as it is relational. How, what are my relationships? What organizations do I need that are going to be in this mix and in this battle for the long run? How do I make sure they have capacity, staffing, all the tools they need to do the work? So it becomes far more of a strategy that's long term versus a single transaction. We tend to, as individual givers, think about writing the check and being done with it. Um, when you really get in the battle, and I, I, Chris, I'm sure you saw this in, in some of the work you were doing with the schools too. I'm sure there were some issues that you took on that were more than a single playground build or uh, an issue that was to be solved with, with a transaction or a set of transactions. So it's, when you get to this notion of the public sector's role in it, it gets even more complicated. Well, let me take it back to, the, from the donor's perspective. I did have the, the honor, the pleasure of working with some individuals over a 35 year span. And some of them were extremely generous. And for them, their philanthropy was not so transactional. From their standpoint, yeah, if I asked them, you know, do you feel good? Are you, 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 you know, they would come back and say, I got the most joy and pleasure out of my direct personal involvement with the cause I cared about or the charity I cared about. I wrote the checks, and I was glad to write the checks, but it was my personal connection that gave them their most deep you know, satisfaction. So all of us, when we think about that, you know, you know, Jim and I do write a few checks, but we spend a lot of time with a couple charities that we care so deeply about, and quite frankly, <laughs> That gives me great pleasure. Yes, and, and I should thank you, Miriam, for giving clarity to my statement, too. Because, as, well, I, I, I have, we have a matching gifts program at the Wilson Foundation. The deadline was today. So what, where do you think I spent my afternoon um, to, to make sure I didn't leave any dollars on the, on the table? And, and perhaps the transactions were transformative for me. What, what Dave was really talking about is that if you want to take on those really hard, complex issues, whether it be around equity or anything else, you can't be naive about it. It takes a long, long time to move the needle. And if you're working with the public sector on, on any questions, it takes seems forever, but you can move the needle. Dave and I both know that it's been 30 years that greenways and parks have been developed, and now you see people calling for mm -hmm. more parks, more greenways, and businesses loving them. It took 30 years. It took five for you to get the municipalities in the region to actually agree to take money, <laughs> it, it, to line them up. I mean, it, I, I remember that like it was yesterday. I, we kept saying, really, they're going to work together? They continue to fight. It, you can do it. As I, was, um, as I was reading to prepare for this conversation, I found an article where an art, a writer suggested that engaged philanthropy is vital to democracy. And another writer suggested that private giving actually adds balance to government. And then finally, there was an article about Miriam's retirement where she talked about believing that she was a public servant. And I have to say that all these ideas, I wasn't expecting to encounter these idea, that idea as I was preparing for this. And I wonder if you could talk more about that relationship between philanthropy and the success of democracy. Well, I'll, I'll take the easy one and then leave it to them to take the rest. But um, charities 
are public organizations. They're 501c3 public charities. Foundations are public charities. And so in that sense, those of us who had the pleasure of being paid to work in these public charities are public servants. It wasn't my money, you know. It, so I truly believe that you have a public accountability. And I think most foundations that I know and the people that work in those foundations share that view. It may not seem that way when they tell you no when you've written your request, but it is true. They, they are not getting rich in those places. They're there to serve. Um, and that's true with, in general, the big ones and the small ones. So, so public, hold them accountable too. I mean, you, you, can, you can come back to these foundations and hold foundations accountable. Dave mentioned earlier that the, the charitable sector is one of the three legs of the stool. And this has been true from the founding of this country in a sense. You have the governmental sector, you have the for-profit sector, and the United States has been fortunate to have this public good sector. And sometimes there are issues where the, the, the public sector, the, the charitable sector, can take on the governmental sector and also push back on, on big business. I was watching one of those happening earlier tonight on the news. So that's a little bit of the sense, but my bet is it was Dave who was making those comments. <laughs> No, um, what a great question from the League of Women Voters. Um, it's sometimes I think the first real experience we have in democratic action is what we do with our service and our giving. Uh, it's not democracy in the sense of putting someone in office, but it's democracy in the sense of how a community comes together to govern itself or to fulfill itself, or to improve itself. And so, think of those actions, as a, especially when you were younger, when you were involved in service, or involved in giving. Because there's, there's money, but there's also time and treasure. Uh, and, and those things are equally important time and, and how you, you present it. I believe that in many cases, it, it's at the roots of that giving where people form their democratic principles. I think that's clear jump up a notch or two. We are uh, at a moment in history where there's money coming from the federal government at a, at a flow that hasn't happened since FDR and the New Deal. Uh, if the state and the municipalities are going to put that money out and have it really work, there's a role for the nonprofit sector and how it plays in that democratic issuance of dollars. Um, one quick example, the, de the, the Department of Natural Resources is going to move $60 million to community parks in the state of Michigan. They don't have the resources to do that. They don't have the staff to move that. They, they can certainly do state parks, but for them to do a grant process statewide to move grants in fifty and $100,000 chunks to the tune of $60 million would be unheard of. The Council of Michigan Foundations has stepped up, starting to work with community foundations to engage communities that are hot spots that the DNR have never worked in of populations, to democratize that giving. That couldn't happen without the nonprofit sector stepping in and providing some resources to work with those public dollars. So I, I really do believe the, press, the, the, the preservation of democracy moving forward is all about community and citizen action. It hurts today to see the divides that we are experiencing. I think the healing to that is how we give differently in community. And perhaps it will be at that level that philanthropy and giving will heal democracy. Yeah, I, I've had the pr privilege this past year, I'm the treasurer also for the Full Circle Foundation. They have the resale up on, on Mac Avenue. And we, were at, we had a big fundraiser back in November. And uh, I was, my wife and daughter and my grand, two of my grandkids were there. And I said to them at the time, you know, kind of joking, I said, I don't know, there was, I don't know, 250 people there. I don't know whether these are Democrats, Republicans, independent, and I, and I don't care. Uh, but here's a group of people with a common cause, with a heart, 
and to help uh, special need kids, especially, well, 18 and 26, but 26 and beyond. And and I and I never I, I don't care whether what political party they're in or whatever, but they're coming together to make their community a better place and helping people, special needs adults, uh, improve their lives. So it, to me, it's really. It, you get, you can hear all this stuff on the news about this group, that group, and what. And when you at that dinner that night, uh, that fundraiser, uh, boy, it didn't matter to me. I just, I just wanted their money. Uh, but, <laughs> and I don't care what party they were in, they as long as they were having fun at the party. But so it's really, but you do need that as a, it's part of the the government's responsibility, private institutions. Uh, the, it's a community effort, and you have to have all three or four legs of the stool there to make it work, or make it work more efficiently. Thank you. So I've done my best to uh, think about the questions and to take the questions that came in from people who registered earlier. But I always like to end interviews by asking people um, what question I didn't ask that I should have asked that they would like to answer. So let me just have you go as a, as a way of closing out. What did I miss and what, what kind of closing thoughts would you like to leave us with? He says he's not going first this time. I got, I got nothing, Chris. Go ahead. <laughs> Wait, I mean, you, you've asked the questions. We've dodged a few, and I hope we've, we've covered a few. Um, but, but the bottom line is, my bet is you're here tonight because you want to make a difference. Uh, and my guess is you already are. Uh, if you have questions on how to give more, give better, uh, there are people that will help you. Um, call me, call Dave. I mean, we'll, we can link you up, and I, and I do a lot of that for people. Because the bottom line is we need everyone. Um, there's just so many needs out there. Uh, yes, we're coming back from COVID, but no, we're not totally coming back from COVID. So I, I do hope that uh, you, will, you will double down, do some more this holiday season. Well, I, I think uh, you mentioned the, the COVID thing. That really affected a lot of organizations in terms of fundraising and their efforts. Um, I know at Full Circle, it really you know, kind of dampened uh, our efforts to get people together and to uh, get donations. So we're coming out of that, thankfully, but uh, that was a challenge. And, uh, and it might be again, but I think we've, we know what we did right and what we did wrong. So. Uh, Joan, I'll just yeah, I'll just add this. I'm, I'm, I'm just continue to ponder your question on democracy, and um, we've we're at this moment in history. You mentioned the rumors and and bad information before the internet. It's gotten so much worse after. We can sit in our own echo chambers and hear ourselves back in the ways we want to over and over again, and never interact with the reality of what's happening in the world. I think that's what philanthropy does. I think that's what nonprofits do. And I, I, I'll just, I'll double down on Miriam's double down. Um, if, you want to, if you want to really participate in democracy and, and other than getting in the voting booth, which we all should do and being well informed, get out with your neighbors and your friends, especially at this, this time of great division and the time of great need as we come out of the pandemic. I want to say thank you and I want you to join me in thanking them for being here this evening. And provocative answers.